Okay, we're going to continue now with the second part of lecture one. Uh, it's lecture one after the break. Um, before the break, we I played a consecutive, and now we want to discuss the terms that were used there in the consecutive. So you can take notes. I always uh, ask uh, or suggest that you have a notebook, a notebook that you use just for terminology. You should have a notebook for your lab and a notebook for the practices that we do in class. That way, you can write all the terminology and have it handy. Okay? And because that's the type, that's what you want to review before you take your exam. Because if you take notes with whatever I explain and you put all those, that, vo that vocabulary there, sometimes it's not very well organized and it's difficult for you to find it when you really need it. When you're doing the practice in the lab, and I am going to already assign the practices now since we're talking about that, uh, you need to complete consecutive practice number one, two, and three. It's the practice that it is assigned for uh, between lecture one and lecture two. All right? So you, all of you will go to the lab and do that. Now, how, what's the purpose of that online lab? Because clearly I can't monitor you there. We don't have the technology yet. A lot of people are working on it, but not yet. But how, what is the purpose of that lab then? Well, the, what you should do is you should, for example, for consecutive practice one, you should go and try to do the lab, the practice. Record yourself, please. It's, the purpose is not for you necessarily to be accurate, but rather to be able to develop short-term memory, whatever we discuss here, or whatever the case is. And, and so you do the practice once, and then you record yourself. If you feel that you didn't do that well, then you can practice it again. But you can practice as many times as you want, but I suggest you don't practice a consecutive more than three times. But you should practice the consecutive, you should play the consecutive once to write down the words that you don't know. And you can do that either before you do the practice or after. I prefer that you do that after, okay? So that you, you train yourself what to do when you come across a term that you don't know. When you write down the vocabulary, make sure that you write the vocabulary that comes out in the practice in the order in which it comes out in the practice, okay? So that way, if you are, if you, if you, when you study it, you study it in that order, and it will, it will be easier just later on in case uh, I play the practice again. The purpose of that practice, again, is for you to develop the skill, all right? Uh, people that are in remote location and, and, and are watching this online as well, we will uh, evaluate you in week number five. And at that time, we may play some of the things that are in your lab, plus some of the things that were actually played here in class, or maybe some new material, okay? So, um, so that's, that's a suggested homework. I'm not gonna give you homework, like you have to study a lot of stuff. The idea is that you study whatever we discuss in class, all the vocabulary, whatever we discuss in class, and also that you do these practices. I want you to really spend most of the time doing these practices, please. Now, let's just talk about the, the consecutive that we just, um, we, we, I, that I played before the break. Now, one thing that I notice, if you have a case number like this, oh, it's changing color, sorry here. Um, just give me a second. Ugh. One second, please. If you have um, a, a, a case number like, for example, J, K, technical difficulties at this point, okay. Okay, J, K, 9, 3, 0, 9, 5, 8. Let's say that's the case number. When you render into Spanish, you, it's preferable that you say JK 930,958. In Spanish, the numbers, I mean, if you ever, if you ever seen a birth certificate coming from Latin America, it's going to be spelled out like that, 2,538,215. Instead of saying it, um, it's not a big deal, but it is a good practice. The government was, what would be the translation for the government in this practice? La Procuraduría Federal, right? We talk about that. Many of the terms that we talked about earlier did come out here. 
Uh, U.S. code is something we did not talk about, and that transfers into Spanish as Código Federal. Código Federal. Código Federal. Um, at the outset, al principio, al comienzo, al inicio, at the outset. U.S. Evidentiary uh, Code, okay, U.S. Evidentiary Code. Um, the translation into Spanish for that one is Código Federal Probatorio, Código Federal Probatorio. Probatorio viene de pruebas. Hmm? And then there was one part that she talked about the FRE, Federal Rules of Evidence. Yeah. When you hear it the first time, there is a protocol for something like that. You hear it the first time, and she said, uh, according to the FRE code or something. Then you, you could simply say, el código FRE. If you leave the acronym, you have to leave the acronym. If, if you leave the acronym as it is, it must sound as it sounds in the original language. It would be incorrect to say el código FRE. The protocol is Código FRE. And then when she said FRE stands for Federal Rules of Evidence, then you can say la sigla o la, la abreviatura FRE en inglés significa Código Federal Probatorio. Okay? Or oh, no, in this case it's Federal Rules of Evidence. So normas federales de probanzas. Federal Rules of Evidence. Normas federales de probanzas. You can say de pruebas too if you want. Probanzas o pruebas, they're both correct. Um, then they use house matters. It's un asunto interno, but you can use anything really that denotes that. Un asunto interno. No? We took care of some house matters. Nos ocupamos de algunos asuntos internos. Mm? So let me just write down here as well. House matters. Asuntos internos. Then there is one that I, most of the time people have problems with this. And the, this time he wasn't the exception, so I'm sure that everybody had problems with this one. He said, you are duly sworn. Mm -hmm. And um, here's the thing. Most people say, usted está debidamente juramentado. Well, that's not what it really refers to. The proper way of translating this is, usted ha prestado debido juramento. So sometimes he said he is duly sworn. Él ha prestado debido, juramento, debido juramento. It is not él está debidamente juramentado. Lo que es debido es el juramento. Lo que se debe de lo que se debe prestar es un juramento. Porque si yo digo él ha prestado él es, él ha sido debidamente juramentado, we're talking about the procedure of swearing you in. But the phrasing in, in English denotes the fact that you must be sworn in before you give testimony. Por eso es usted ha prestado debido juramento. El debido modifica al juramento. No es un procedimiento. It's a very common mistake. So, if you say he, um, he is duly sworn, él ha prestado debido juramento. No, él está debidamente juramentado. Okay, that's a very common mistake. Uh, then it gets into complicated things like bidders, potential bidders. You know what bidders are? ¿Cómo, cómo? Okay, what about oferentes, licitadores, a bid es una licitación, oferentes will be very good here for bidders, hmm? licitadores is perfectly fine as well. So potential bidders of stocks and share, and shares. You could say the acciones for both, hmm? there is nothing wrong with this, you can say acciones. Um, the differences in the translation between a stock and a share, I'll give that to you as well, but you don't have to do that if you don't want to. You can leave acciones and that's good enough. 
stocks translate into Spanish as acciones participantes, meaning that when the company is sold, or then whatever the company has, the assets of the company, the profit or, or the yield produced by selling that asset will be distributed among those people that have stocks. That's when, when they build a company from the ground up and they want to hire somebody, they don't have the money, they offer always stocks, they don't offer shares. So you become owner of the company somehow. Shares, on the other hand, is son acciones participantes. Oh, uh, pardon. Stocks es acciones fundadoras. Sorry, made a mistake here, correction. Stocks son acciones fundadoras, please correct that, fundadoras. And shares son acciones participantes. So once again, stocks, acciones fundadoras. Mm? And shares, acciones participantes. Why? Because participan de la ganancia solamente, no de los bienes que tiene la, la empresa. Okay. But you don't have to say that. You can just simply say acciones for both. Rendimiento is yield. Okay, rendimiento is yield. And then he said something like acciones de la más alta categoría. De la más alta categoría. This one I would please put an asterisk next to this one for your exam. And um, this is called, is known as blue chip stocks. If you don't know the equivalent term, of course you can say, pre, uh, some people say prefer store stocks, but you can convey the meaning, stocks that, uh, high yield stocks, you can convey that meaning. So we're talking about, like, for example, AAA they're, ta they're, they're talking about companies that, uh, have been established for a very long period of time, and that yes, they do have a good rating in terms of what what they what type of profit they they produce, they yield. Yeah, uh, but the, the 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 important thing to remember is that if you ever hear blue chip stocks, then that must be acciones de la más alta categoría. Okay. Uh, the other way you see because when you hear in Spanish you can sort of explain, but the the problem is if you hear in English, what are you going to say? Blue chip stocks. Acción es blue chip. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Blue chip could be even uh, what? Could it be those uh, chips, that potato chips and stuff that are blue? I don't know. Could be so many things. So it, it's important that you that you know particularly in one direction, and we will. I will explain that in a few minutes. What I mean by that. Um, Mercado alcista, we already know that, I explained this already, is bull market. Bull market. And one way to remember that it's bull market is that the bull has the horns, so they point up, so Mercado alcista. That's the way I can remember. Mercado bajista is bear market. Bear market. Okay, sudaba la gota gorda. Suddenly talks about now idiomatic expressions. Sudaba la gota gorda, he would sweat bullets, right? Yes. Sudaba la gota gorda. He would sweat bullets. Uh, lo sacaba de quicio. Drum him nuts, yeah, drove him nuts. Sacar de quicio. To drive someone crazy or nuts. Then it used, at one point she said, so the scheme backfire, right? Now we know that scheme is complot. We talked about it uh, in lecture one before the break. Backfire, we know that as an idiomatic expression, it means to backfire is le salió el tiro por la culata, right? But in this expression where it says, so the, the, the scheme backfire, it's difficult to combine the meaning of salir el tiro por la culata con complot, because then you say, el complot le salió por la culata. That sounds really awkward, right? <laughs> so what we like to say for something like this, particularly when there is, when uh, backfire has something 
before, we like to say fracasar. We, we, we just basically say, entonces fracasó el complot. We don't keep the same register necessarily, but the message is much clearer. So the scheme backfired. The scheme backfired. Fracasó el complot. Fracasó el complot. Could you, the question is if you could say salió mal el complot. It's always preferable than to leave it in the, in the original language. It's pref I would prefer you use fracaso el complot, but you, don't, you can say salió mal el complot. That's okay. It's still okay. It conveys the meaning, right? Um, what about this one? You went too far, right? Went too far, se excedió. Pasó de la raya, right? La raya. Se excedió. Se pasó la mano, that's fine. Se pasó la mano. And to give a damn, what's that? He didn't give a damn. No le, le importaba un bledo, le importaba un bledo, right? Give a damn. Importar un bledo. These are very important idiomatic expressions. Then there was a line that uh, was there, I mean, I. It was there to see whether you are too obsessed about individual words or you are more obsessed about the message itself. And when we talk about today, in a few minutes, in about 10, 15 minutes, we talk about um, this idea of the message versus the individual words, you're going to understand why. But there was a line there that sounded like this. Uh, let me write it down here. There was a segment that sounded like this. It said, uh, brokers, brokers who are on the floor of the stock exchange. Now, if we are concentrated about single words, you may say agentes bursátiles que están en el piso del, de la bolsa. That's very, the message is very, very complicated like that in Spanish. It doesn't make much sense. It's always preferable to say agentes bursátiles que trabajan en la bolsa. Como que están en el piso. It's like saying, please give me the floor, and you interpret that as saying, deme el piso. ¿Qué piso? Deme la palabra. Right? Oh, I'm going to give the floor to Mr. Rodriguez. No le voy a dar el piso al señor Rodriguez. Le voy a dar la palabra. Hopefully you won't do that. So the translation for this is basically, this segment is a segment that is put there to see whether you can convey a message rather than to concentrate on single words. But you know, this is, these are very difficult because to convey a message, you better have this original somewhere written down or you better remember exactly what it is. I always tell students that there is one technique that in consecutive that people tend to um, not to use at all and that's very powerful and that technique is called um, uh, visualization. Visualizing, you can see a person sitting, I mean not sitting, standing in the stock market. And then that's the message. El agente bursátil que trabaja en la bolsa. And that's what I would prefer you use that. Agentes bursátiles que trabajan en la bolsa. La bolsa de valores, la bolsa de cambios. Um, Él no inventó la pólvora. What's that? He did not reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Él no inventó la pólvora. He did not reinvent the wheel. Uh, all this, the, the reason why the federal exam has a lot of idiomatic expressions in some of those consecutive parts, particularly in consecutive and also in some side readings, is to test you to see whether the candidate is able to transfer the message more than the individual words. That's something you have to keep, you know, to, to, to be, um, to keep in mind at all times, okay? It's about the message, not about the words. Sometimes the individual words make the message. But in general, it's the message that counts, not the individual words. So. Face value, anybody knows what that is? Valor nominal. Valor 
nominal. It's the value that it is on that paper, right? It doesn't mean that it is the value that it is traded for or that the market value. Dice un poco turbio. What when he says es un poco turbio? It's rather what? Okay. Murky, shady, right? Crooked. It assumes that it has now an element of intent there. Uh, murky will be good. Shady, it will be good as well. No tiene ningún sostén jurídico. Exactamente. Legal grounds. You can also say legal merits. And the last one, I think, is me partí el corazón. Yeah. El corazón. It broke my heart. Uh, it's possible that when you hear me partí el corazón, you automatically know that it means he broke my heart. But when you hear he broke my heart, sometimes you don't know that it means partir for to break. You may say me rompió el corazón. But the expression is me partió el corazón. So be careful with the, when you transfer this, when you're learning a term like this, because in one direction, you might be more familiar with into the opposite direction. It happens often, so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you some uh, tips on that. Before we move on to the next part of this class, any questions on that's consecutive, either vocabulary or anything? Do you think the accuracy of your consecutive was uh, over 80%? Okay, then you fail it. You fail the exam. You need to get 80% or better to pass, okay? Did you have a question? But there's yeah, mercado de valores. Okay. When you said, you know, stock market. Shares, yeah. Mercado de valores. Yeah, but in reverse to stocks and shares, valores. Uh, oh, okay. Um, no, mercado de valores is still translates as stock market. Yeah, es uh, como mercado bursátil. I think that what we need to uh, be careful is um, cartera de valores. There is mercado de valores is the stock market, but there is also cartera de valores, que es portfolio. Have you heard that? That's portfolio, which was not used in the practice, but that's what it means. The other one? Okay. What we're going to do next is talk a little bit about uh, site translation and a couple of things, and then I'll put another practice. It will be uh, a simultaneous practice, and probably that will be it. We'll finish uh, the session because it will take some time to do both. Um, so in consecutive, we already know what the challenges are. We have to, you know that you need to develop the necessary skill to remember segments like this. These are the segments that you're going to be facing when you take the exam, the, the length of it. So if you feel that you didn't get 80%, which most likely you didn't, then there is some work to be done. So we're going to start working on this next week, okay? Next week we're going to start with consecutive techniques, all right? But now it's, we take this session more like as an assessment of where you are at and what needs to be done more than anything else. Now the next question is, what about sight translation? How well or how good are you in sight readings? Well, this one, unfortunately, you will find that if it's something that you do on a daily basis, you're really good at it. So if it is a form that you interpret all the time, like a DUI, advisement, advisement of rights, waiver, and plea form, no, no big deal. A guilty plea form, no big deal. But if you, that's not what they, they are going to use in an, in, in an exam. So what they will be using in an exam is something that you probably have never seen before. Now there are certain, we have to understand how that part of the, that portion of the exam is going to be graded. What they want to know is, what the way they will evaluate you is, li they listen to your rendition, say for example the original is in English and you interpret that into Spanish. So they listen to the Spanish, your Spanish, without even looking at the English. And the question that they have to answer is, does it make sense? 
somebody who speaks Spanish, would that person understand what this interpreter is saying? If the answer is yes, then they move on to step number two, which is to look at the accuracy on it. But if the answer is no, you fail. So that's important. It's critical because you may be very accurate in portions of it, but the overall, that doesn't convey the right message. In deciding whether you, uh, as a candidate, make sense in the rendition, basically what they're saying is how many of these key messages, because a, 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 a side reading has many messages, how many of those were properly delivered? And it's not about the single words that they are looking uh, for, but they are really looking for the, the proper delivery of the messages, all right? Now, this brings out an interesting thing. When you have a site translation that goes, let's say, from English into Spanish, uh, you may come across idiomatic expressions, and those idiomatic expressions do not transfer word for word. Let's cross that bridge once we get there. No es vamos a cruzar el puente cuando lleguemos ahí. It's todo a su debido tiempo, vayamos paso a paso. Uh, it's raining cats and dogs is not llueve gatos y perros. It's llueve a cántaros o llueve mucho. He's moving at a snail pace, no es se mueve a paso de caracol, sino que es a paso de tortuga. This is important to keep in mind because you need to know those idiomatic expressions very well, simply, be, simply because of this principle. They need to see whether the message is properly conveyed. So in English into Spanish, one of the challenges is dealing with those idiomatic expressions, and they also use slangs. Some slangs in English, like for example, he was having a couple of brewskis when the cops arrived and threw everybody in the can. And that is slang. And they didn't say he was having a couple of beers when the police arrived and arrested them. No, he said he was having a couple of brewskis when the cops came and threw them in, everybody in the can. And, 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 and that's, that's important to keep what we call register, right? The register, if at all possible, we want to keep it. But here's a, here's a question that I have for you. Okay, here's the word brewskis, okay? What is the equivalent term for brewskis at the same register? Well, that term depends on the country where you're interpreting for. So that, 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 uh, the answer that you just gave me, that it depends on the country, is what it is technically known as localization. You localize to one country or you localize to another country. In the federal exam, they do not mind to which country you localize, from English into Spanish. You can localize to Spain, you can localize to Venezuela, Peru, Chile, whatever country you want, Mexico, whatever country you want, El Salvador, Nicaragua, República Dominicana, Puerto Rico, whatever you want, from English into Spanish. So that's an advantage, and that's why most people pass this component of the exam. Hmm? However, um, they get you in the Spanish into English, and I'll tell you how that happens. So localization, in terms of slangs or, or, or any terms that, that require you that you keep the register, is not that important in the English into Spanish. You don't have to define, you know, I'm going to localize. They don't tell you, like in most interpreting exams, or oh, you localize to Mexico, Central America, but not to South America. These are guidelines for people that train um, uh, people, uh, students. So you, you need to know where to localize for the state exam. But in the federal, no problem. So if they use a foul language, which could have different ways of localizing, then you can use with whatever foul language you want. Doesn't matter. Now, I don't want you to confuse localizing with sending the right message. For example, if I say, let's say that it's an, uh, I, it's an, advert, an ad for, a, for a, um, uh, an airline that, uh, that is, um, has uh, leather seats, and if, if the, in English you say, fly on leather, that doesn't mean that in Spanish it's vuelo en cuero. <laughs> because now the message is completely different. One means naked and the other one means on leather. In English, it means fly on leather seats, right? But there is this tendency in English to abbreviate, whereas in Spanish, it's just the opposite. So, vuelo en cuero, no, it doesn't work that well, okay? So that's important. It's one thing is the message, the other thing is localization. So 
I don't expect that you will have a lot of problems. Now, there, here's a, a, an area that you might have difficulties with. They may be using federal agencies in the original. The FAA, the FTC, and all that stuff. That's what it is. That's what you will be able to find those federal agencies in the manual for this class. There's a lot of uh, huge section on it as a reference tool. But please only study the ones, or make sure you study the ones that come up in the practices. All right? Okay. We will. But if you want to know all the agencies, they're all translated for you over there. Now the site translation into Spanish, the, from Spanish into English. Now it's a completely different proposition because. The Spanish into English, first of all, when they pick a site translation in Spanish, they have to pick it from a given country. They can't pick one that it applies to all countries. So if you want to use this slang, if you want to give a site translation from Spanish into English in, that includes slang, you have to pick it from a given country. So you, they automatically localize it for you. They pick it from Mexico, Venezuela, Ecuador, whatever. So if they pick it from Mexico, then it may say, se estaba echando unas chelitas cuando vino la chota y los metió en el bote. And then you transfer that he was having some bruskis when the cops arrived and threw everybody in the can. So, so that you have that equivalency. The thing is that the same thing that occurs with slang, localization of slangs, also occurs with legal terms. And as we discussed in the, uh, before our break today, if you get a document that is legal and it comes from Mexico or Central America, Ministerio Público will be used way more than Fiscalía or Fiscal. Because if you use Fiscal in Mexico, it tends to refer to a tax authority. Autoridad Fiscal it has nothing to do with the actual prosecution. So uh, when you get the site from Spanish into English in, this, in the federal exam, you need to be careful because you need to understand comprehension of source and it is pretty much they determine where you, they want you to comprehend that source from either Mexico Central America or whatever we're gonna do several sites here I have to tell you that there is one site that it is a power of attorney coming from Mexico that it is a killer and we need to it takes a long time to learn that because if you read it in Spanish, you have no idea what it says. It's just so confusing. So, and on top of that, we have another problem. The, the way you are graded, as I told you earlier, is they listen to your rendition. In this case, it will be the rendition in English. And they will ask themselves, or the, the examiner will ask himself or herself, does it sound right? Does it make sense in English? Now. In many instances, some of the expressions that you see in Spanish, when you transfer them into English word for word, doesn't sound right. Hmm? It just doesn't sound as if you were reading a document that was actually written in that language. For example, le saluda atentamente su más fiel y seguro servidor. You can say, your most faithful and humble servant salutes you attentively. What type of ending is that? Right? So you may say, well, respectfully, uh, respectfully yours or respectfully submitted. I don't know, whatever you want. But that's important, right? For example, um, uh, se le informó de las sanciones a las que se expone toda persona que declara falsos. That's under penalty of perjury. So all these structures that we are talking about become very important in the site. But it doesn't mean that when you hear under penalty of perjury in English, you have to say all that jazz that I just mentioned. You can say so pena de perjurio. Because remember, from English into Spanish, there is no localization. But when you, he when you see it in, in Spanish, they already force you to localize into English, but you have to also comprehend the Spanish from that country. So the question is, from what country do you think they get that, the federal exam get the sites? Well, it will be Mexico, Guatemala, Nicaragua, there is a possibility of one from Spain. Okay? It's very rare that they will use something from South America. So we need to concentrate on that, on those particular areas. The other problem that you have from Spanish into English is that that localization that I'm talking about, which is nothing else than delivering in such a way that it makes sense in the opposite language, really, 
It also occurs with structures. The structures do not match. I don't know if you've ever seen a document that is written in Spanish. It could be a whole page long with no periods. But when you look at a document in English, it's, that will not be acceptable because it's one problem that we have between these two, the English language and the Spanish language, is that in Spanish when we conjugate a verb, we already know what the pronoun is. But in English, if you don't indicate the pronoun, you don't know what the, I mean, if you conjugate a verb with the pronoun, you don't know what the pronoun is. For example, if I say the pronoun uh, for plate in past tense, it could be anything. But if in, if in Spanish you say jugué, you know it's yo jugué. So in Spanish, there is a tendency to keep going so that the, the, the of, uh, I say the standard structure of a sentence, sujeto, verbo, and the rest, which is the same in English, that is not followed. But in English, you do have to follow it. So there is also the issue of restructuring, localizing the structures. And of course, the word order comes into play. There is a big difference in Spanish between un hombre grande y un gran hombre. Right? So this is important in transferring into English. Okay? So that's another uh, difficult thing that we're going to see here as well. And the last thing that is important is the style in which documents are written. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you get a document from Mexico, very often you will see a letter C before the word juez, which means ciudadano juez. Clearly, you don't transfer into English citizen judge. You have to transfer as this judge. If it's in the federal jurisdiction, maybe magistrate. If it's a ciudadano juez federal de primera instancia, it will be magistrate. But what magistrate? It will be from Mexico, most likely. So Mexican magistrate, I guess. So you got to denote the, where the country, I mean, if the site was written in Mexico, when you transfer, as we talked about before the break, you need to make sure that you indicate that as well. Because if I just simply say U.S. magistrate for juez federal de primera instancia, that doesn't work. Because it may say juez federal de primera instancia del eh, quinto distrito en eh, el estado de Guanajuato. Okay, well, then you cannot transfer that as U.S. Marshal, Marshal, I mean, U.S. Magistrate. You can't, because they are talking about some a judge in Mexico, and you're conveying the meaning completely different. St there is also the possibility that the style ha comes with the location of each sentence. For example, it is not unusual for a document that is written in Spanish coming from Mexico and Central America to start with, en la ciudad de a tantos días del mes de tal. So, for example, en la ciudad de... Este, México a los 15 días del mes de enero de 2002. When you transfer that into English, legal documents in English do not begin with in the city of whatever the case is. That information tends to be at the end of the document. In fact, the document in English ends with this document was executed in the city of Mexico on such and such date and such and such time. Obviously, it is not a good idea for you to say, okay, here in the original we have that phrase, that is structure that I have to put into English and put it at the end because that's how the documents are written in English. It may not be a good idea because you may forget, but you can still keep it where it is, where it is and say something like this, the following document was executed in the city of Mexico on such and such date. That's the equivalent for en la ciudad de México a tal y tal día. So we have that issue to deal with as well, all right? So those are the challenges in sight. That makes the sight from Spanish into English way more difficult than English into Spanish. Okay? And that's why most people have difficulties with it. On top of that, in the federal exam, that sight could be on things that you have never heard before. I remember many, many years ago, they had a sight translation on uh, uh, somebody that was living the last will and testament, and they was living, for example, dejo mi colección de mariposas y mi mecedora a mi querido amigo, and all that stuff was part of it. And you know, you may not know that that's a rocking chair, you may not know how to say this, how to say butterflies, you know, these are things you understand, but they are not there because you don't use it on a daily basis. They're not there in the opposite language. So we need to make sure that we cover that as well. That's the challenge for site translation. Any questions before we move on now to a simultaneous practice? Okay. The next step, the next components, of course, uh, happen to be simultaneous. 
and, and, and the two simultaneous that you will do in, the, in your state exam will be the easy one, I call the easy one at 120, 130, 140, more like 140, and then the cross-examination of an expert witness. What we're going to do next is I'm going to be playing some simultaneous practices. You just basically interpret. That's all you have to do. There will be some, legal, some uh, federal uh, terms there as well. And all I want you to do is to try to interpret. If you don't know a term, don't worry. I'm writing them down anyway, and we will discuss them later on. And uh, so we'll play that practice, and then I'll discuss it with you, and then we'll finish for this evening, okay? So let me just uh, prepare everything here so that I can... Uh, All right, so it's going to be a simultaneous practice, and that's all I'm telling you. It, it's equivalent to, I'm not even going to tell you that. Just interpret it, all right? Here we go. Simultaneous. <laughs> Simultaneous. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall take a few moments now to give you some initial instructions about this case and about your duties as jurors. At the end of the trial, I shall give you further instructions. I may also give you instructions during the trial. Unless I specifically tell you otherwise, all such instructions, both those I give you now and those I give you later, are equally binding on you and must be followed. This is a criminal case brought against the defendants by the United States government. The defendant is charged with the crime of attempted murder after substantial planning and premeditation. That charge is set forth in what is called an indictment, which I will ask the government attorney to summarize for you at the end of these instructions. You should understand that an indictment is simply an accusation. It is not evidence of anything. The defendant has pleaded not guilty and is presumed to be innocent unless and until proved guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It will be your duty to decide from the evidence whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty of the crime charged. From the evidence, you will decide what the facts are. You are entitled to consider that evidence in the light of your own observations and experiences in the affairs of life. You may use reason and common sense to draw deductions or conclusions from facts which have been established by the evidence. You will then apply those facts to the law which I give you in these and in my other instructions, and in that way reach your verdict. You are the sole judges of the facts, but you must follow the law as stated in my instructions whether you agree with it or not. Do not allow sympathy or prejudice to influence you. The law demands of you a just verdict, unaffected by anything except the evidence, your common sense, and the law as I give it to you. You should not take anything I may say or do during the trial as indicating what I think of the evidence or what I think your verdict should be. Finally, please remember that only this defendant, not anyone else, is on trial here, and that this defendant is on trial only for the crime charged not for anything else. In deciding what the facts are, you may have to decide what testimony you believe and what testimony you do not believe. You may believe all of what a witness said, or only part of it, or none of it. In deciding what testimony of any witness to believe, consider the witness's intelligence, the opportunity the witness had to have seen or heard the things testified about, the witness's memory, any motives that witness may have for testifying a certain way, the manner of the witness while testifying, whether the witness said something different at an earlier time, the general reasonableness of the testimony, and the extent to which the testimony is consistent with other evidence that you believe. At the end of the trial, you must take, make your decision based on what you recall of the evidence. You will not have a written transcript to consult, and it may not be practical for the court reporter to read back lengthy testimony. You must pay close attention to the testimony as it is given. If you wish, however, you may take notes to help you remember what witnesses said. If you do take notes, 
Please keep them to yourself until you and your fellow jurors go to the jury room to decide the case. And do not let note-taking distract you so that you do not hear other answers by the witness. When you leave at night, your notes will be secured and not read by anyone. During the trial, it may be necessary for me to talk with the lawyers out of the hearing of the jury, either by having a bench conference here while the jury is present in the courtroom or by calling a recess. Please understand that while you are waiting, we are working. The purpose of these conferences is to decide how certain evidence is to be treated under the rules of evidence and to avoid confusion and error. We will, of course, do what we can to keep the number and length of these conferences to a minimum. Finally, to ensure fairness, you as jurors must obey the following rules. First, do not talk among yourselves about this case or about anyone involved with it until the end of the case when you go to the jury room to decide on your verdict. Second, do not talk with anyone else about this case or about anyone involved with it until the trial has ended and you have been discharged as jurors. Third, when you are outside the courtroom, do not let anyone tell you anything about the case or about anyone involved with it until the trial has ended and your verdict has been accepted by me. If someone should try to talk to you about the case during the trial, please report it to me. Fourth, during the trial you should not talk with or speak to any of the parties, lawyers, or witnesses involved in this case. You should not even pass the time of day with any of them. It is important not only that you do justice in this case, but that you also give the appearance of doing justice. If a person from one side of the lawsuit sees you talking to a person from the other side, even if it is simply to pass the time of day, an unwarranted and unnecessary suspicion about your fairness might be aroused. If any lawyer, party, or witness does not speak to you when you pass in the hall, ride the elevator or the like, it is because they are not supposed to talk or visit with you. Fifth, do not read any news stories or articles about the case or about anyone involved with it, or listen to any radio or television reports about the case or about anyone involved with it. In fact, until the trial is over, I suggest that you avoid reading any newspapers or news journals at all, and avoid listening to any TV or radio newscasts at all. I do not know whether there might be any news reports of this case, but if there are, you might inadvertently find yourself reading or listening to something before you could do anything about it. If you want, you can have your spouse or a friend clip out any stories and set them aside to give you after the trial is over. It is important for you to understand that this case must be decided by the evidence presented in the case and the instructions I give you. Sixth. Do not do any research or make any investigation on your own about any matter involved in this case. By way of examples, that means you must not read from a dictionary or a textbook or an encyclopedia or talk with a person you consider knowledgeable or go to the internet for information about some issues in this case. In fairness, learn about this case from the evidence you receive here at the trial and apply it to the law as I give it to you. Seventh, do not make up your mind during the trial about what the verdict should be. Keep an open mind until after you have gone to the jury room to decide the case and you and your fellow jurors have discussed the evidence. End of simultaneous. There is no jail sentence for a conviction of an infraction. However, your willful failure to appear in court or to pay a fine for an infraction is punishable as a misdemeanor and the court may impose a jail sentence or a fine. If you are fined, there is a significant penalty assessment which will exceed the amount of your fine and it will be added to the amount you must pay. These funds are used for such things as peace officer training or driver training. Further, there is a $35 fee for any continuance of a payment of a fine. Before you decide how to plead to the charge, you should be aware of your constitutional rights. You have the right to an attorney. 
the right to a jury or court trial, the right against self-incrimination, the right to confront and cross-examine witnesses, and the right to bail. We will explain those rights to you. You are entitled to the services of an attorney of your own choice at all stages of the proceedings, including the arraignment. If you wish to talk to an attorney before entering your plea, please tell the judge and the case may be continued for that purpose. If you want an attorney but do not have the money to hire one, the judge will appoint an attorney to represent you at no cost. If an attorney is appointed, the judge will ask you about your financial status at the end of your case to see if you can afford to contribute to the cost of the attorney. If you do not wish to have an attorney, you may waive or give up the right to an attorney and represent yourself. Before you can do this, the judge must decide that your decision is voluntarily, knowing and intelligent, as there are disadvantages to self-representation. You do not have the right to an appointed attorney for a traffic infraction unless you are in custody. However, if you are not in custody, you may retain an attorney at your own expense. You have the right to a jury trial. A jury consists of 12 people selected from the community who must decide if you are guilty or not guilty of the alleged offense. To be found guilty, the jury must reach a unanimous verdict. Members of the jury, you have heard all the evidence and now it is my duty to instruct you on the law that applies to this case. The law requires that I read the instructions to you. You will have these instructions in written form in the jury room to refer to during your deliberations. You must base your decision on the facts and the law. You have two duties to perform. First, you must determine what facts have been proved from the evidence received in the trial and not from any other source. A fact is something proved by the evidence or by stipulation. A stipulation is an agreement between attorneys regarding the facts. Second, you must apply to the law that I state to you in the facts as you determine them and in this way arrive at your verdict. You must accept and follow the law as I state it to you regardless of whether you agree with the law. If anything concerning the law has said by the attorneys in their arguments or at any other time during the trial conflicts with my instructions on the law, you must follow my instructions. You must not be influenced by pity or prejudice against a defendant. You must not be biased against a defendant because he has been arrested for this offense, charged with a crime, or brought to trial. None of these circumstances is evidence of guilt, and you must not infer or assume from any or all of them that a defendant is more likely to be guilty than not guilty. You must not be influenced by mere sentiment, conjecture, sympathy, passion, prejudice, public opinion, or public feeling. Both the people and the defendant have a right to expect that you will conscientiously consider and weigh the evidence, apply the law, and reach a just verdict regardless of the consequences. If any rule, direction, or idea is repeated or stated in different ways in these instructions, no emphasis is intended, and you must not draw any inference because of its repetition. Do not single out any particular sentence or individual point or instruction and ignore the others. Consider the instructions as a whole and each in light of all the others. The order in which the instructions are or have been given has no significance as to their relative importance. Statements made by the attorneys during the trial are not evidence. However, if the attorneys have stipulated or agreed to a fact, you must regard that fact as proven as to the party or parties making the stipulation. If an objection was sustained to a question, do not guess what the answer might have been. Do not speculate as to the reason for the objection. Do not assume to be true any insinuation suggested by a question asked a witness. A question is not evidence and may be considered only as it helps you to understand the answer. Do not consider for any purpose any other 
any offer of evidence that was rejected or any evidence that was stricken by the court. Treat it as though you had never heard of it. You must decide all questions of fact, in this case, from the evidence received in this trial and not from any other source. When a witness has testified through a certified court interpreter, you must accept the English interpretation of that testimony, even if you would have translated the foreign language differently. You must not independently investigate the facts or the law or consider or discuss facts as to which there is no evidence. This means, for example, that you must not, on your own, visit the scene, conduct experiments, or consult reference works or persons for additional information. You must not discuss this case with any other person except the fellow juror, and then only after the case is submitted to you for your decision, and only when all the 12 jurors are present in the jury room. You will be, or have been, given notebooks and pencils. Leave them on your seat in the jury room when you leave each day and at each recess. You will be able to take them into the jury room when you deliberate. A word of caution, you may take notes. However, you should not permit note-taking to distract you from the ongoing proceedings. Remember, you are the judges of the believability of witnesses. Notes are only an aid to memory and should not take precedence over recollection. A juror who does not take notes should rely on his or her recollection of the evidence and not be influenced by the fact that the other jurors do take notes. Notes are for the note taker's own personal use in refreshing his or her recollection of the evidence. Finally, should any discrepancy exist between a juror's recollection of the evidence and a juror's notes, or between one juror's recollection and that of another, you may request that the reporter read back the relevant testimony which must prevail. The word willfully, when applied to the intent with which an act is done or omitted, means with a purpose or willingness to commit the act or to make the omission in question. The word willfully does not require any intent to violate the law or to injure another or to acquire any advantage. The word knowingly means with knowledge or of the existence of the facts in question. Knowledge of the unlawfulness of any act or omission is not required. A requirement of knowledge does not mean that the act must be done with any specific intent. Evidence consists of testimony of witnesses, writings, material objects, or anything presented to the senses and offered to prove the existence or non-existence of a fact. Evidence is either direct or circumstantial. Direct evidence is evidence that directly proves a fact. It is evidence which by itself is found to be true, establishes that fact. Circumstantial evidence is evidence that, if found to be true, proves a fact from which an inference of the existence of another fact may be drawn. An inference is a deduction of fact that may logically and reasonably be drawn from another fact or group of facts established by the evidence. It is not necessary that facts be proved by direct evidence. They may be proved also by circumstantial evidence or by a combination of direct and circumstantial evidence. Both direct and circumstantial evidence are acceptable as a means of proof. Neither is entitled to any greater weight than the other. However, a finding of guilty as to any crime may not be based on circumstantial evidence unless the proved circumstances are not only one, consistent with the theory that the defendant is guilty of the crime, but two, cannot be reconciled with any other rational conclusion. Further, each fact which is essential to complete a set of circumstances necessary to establish the defendant's guilt must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. In other words, before an inference essential to establish guilt may be found to have been proved beyond a reasonable doubt, each fact or circumstance on which the inference necessarily rests must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Also, if the circumstantial evidence as to any particular count permits two reasonable interpretations, one of which points to the defendant's guilt and the other to his innocence, you must adopt that interpretation that points to the defendant's innocence and reject that interpretation that points to his guilt. If, on the other hand, one interpretation of this evidence appears to you to be reasonable and the other interpretation to be unreasonable, you must accept the reasonable interpretation and reject the unreasonable. The specific intent or and mental state with which an act is done may be shown by the circumstances surrounding the commission of the act. However, you may not find the defendant guilty of a crime charged in counts and or crimes of which are lesser crimes or find the allegation to be true 
unless the proved circumstances are not only one, consistent with the theory that the defendant had the required specific intent or an mental state, but two, cannot be reconciled with any other rational conclusion. Also, if the evidence as to any specific intent or mental state permits two reasonable interpretations, one which points to the existence of the specific intent or mental state, and the other to its absence, you must adopt the interpretation which points its absence. If, on the other hand, one interpretation of the evidence as to the specific intent or mental state appears to you to be reasonable, and the other interpretation to be unreasonable, you must accept the reasonable interpretation and reject the unreasonable. Neither side is required to call as witnesses all persons who may have been present at any of the events disclosed by the evidence or who may appear to have some knowledge of these events. Neither side is required to produce all objects or documents mentioned or suggested by the evidence. Evidence that at some other time a witness made a statement or statements that is or are inconsistent or consistent with his testimony in this trial may be considered by you not only for the purpose of testing the credibility of the witness, but also as evidence of the truth of the facts as stated by the witness on that former occasion. If you disbelieve a witness's testimony that he no longer remembers a certain event, that testimony is inconsistent with a prior statement or statements by him describing that event. Every person who testifies under oath or affirmation is a witness. You are sole judges of the believability of a witness and the weight to be given the testimony of each witness. In determining the believability of a witness, you may consider anything that has a tendency to prove or disprove the truthfulness of the testimony of the witness, including but not limited to any of the following. The extent of the opportunity or ability of the witness to see or hear or otherwise become aware of any matter about which the witness testified. The ability or of the witnesses to remember or to communicate any matter about which the witness testified. The character and quality of that testimony. The demeanor and manner of the witness while testifying. The existence or non-existence of a bias, interest or other motive. The existence or non-existence of any fact test testified to by the witness the attitude of the witness toward the, this action or toward the giving of testimony. Discrepancies in a witness's testimony or between a witness's testimony and that of other witnesses, if there, are, if there were any, do not necessarily mean that any or a witness should be discredited. Failure of recollection is common. Innocent misrecollection is not uncommon. Two persons witnessing an incident or a transaction often will, often will see or hear it differently. Whether a discrepancy pertains to an important matter or only to something trivial should be considered by you. Interesting practice. It was pretty good at the beginning, but then suddenly it went, jumped to 170 words per minute. So what we did is I play practice at a speed that at the beginning is the first one and the second one, they're both at the speed of the federal exam, simultaneous one. But then I, pra I play the next practice at the speed of simultaneous two, without being cross-examination. And it's, it's, uh, you know, it's difficult, particularly when you do that at the end of the class, towards the end of the class, because you're already pretty tired and all this stuff. And based on the time now, it's even worse, right? Um, so let's go over a few terms. Did you feel that was difficult or no? It was good. It was fast. It was very fast. You have to remember that to be able to interpret an expert witness at 160, hmm, where there is question and answers taking place, you need to be able to interpret things like this at 180. That's the requirement. To interpret an expert witness at 160 requires a speed of 180 for um, for this type of simultaneous practice. So you haven't actually gotten that. This is about 165, 170. We'll try a couple of times, 200, 190, and let's see what happens. You, of course, you can't interpret everything, but at least you, you, know, you just have to try to keep up with it, yes. What was the last portion? The last portion, what speed was it? Yeah. 165 to 175. It was not sustained, so it varied slightly. But it started very slowly, right? And then suddenly it just took off. Okay, a couple of uh, things, and then we'll uh, finish for uh, the day. Um, indictment 
Right. Es acusación formal por el gran jurado, aceptada por, o admitida por el gran jurado. Acusación formal. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you a secret about the fact that it's so long. Uh, the proper translation is acusación formal aceptada por el gran jurado o admitida por el gran jurado. They're both correct. But here's the nice thing, nice thing about this. When you are in, in, in taking the federal exam, we already know that it is a federal term. You already know that you're in federal court. So you can simplify by just simply acusación formal. That's good enough. You don't have to say acusación formal emitida por el gran jurado. You just simply say acusación formal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, of course, if somebody asks you this question out of context and not in federal court, you have to give all this explanation. Because otherwise, you know, you're, you're, not, you're, you're not in a place. See, the localization is also, it also occurs when you know where you're interpreting. If we're interpreting federal court, I don't have to say a lot of things that otherwise I would have to say to clarify it if I were not interpreting federal court. And this is one of the things. He's on trial. That's an interesting one. Está siendo procesado, eh? Está siendo procesado. He's on trial. Reasonableness is sensatez, exactamente. Sensatez, the reasonableness of your testimony. La sensatez de su declaración. This one was a problem for some of you, okay? And it wasn't too fast, actually, but still, your notes, your notes will be secured. Uh, you know, notes, apuntes, some of you say notas, apuntes will be preferred. Well, will be secure, so it, uh, it's better to be transferred into Spanish as quedarán resguardadas. Will be secured. Quedarán resguardadas. Um, secure is an interesting thing because you can secure the scene of the crime too. Right? That's a different meaning. No es resguardar el lugar de los hechos. Maybe it's, I don't know, acordonar el lugar de los hechos. There are so many possibilities for that, to cordon off. Uh, secure, it's a difficult term. But when you secure some an object, you know, like in this case, it's just perfect for this expression. Like you secure the notes, van a ser resguardadas. Protegidas, resguardadas. That's what it really means. Um, fellow juror. This fellow is a problem for us. You don't want to say compañero, miembro del jurado. Sounds really, sounds like those American movies translated into Spanish and you, when you watch them in Latin America, you say, oh my God, what is she saying, right? Just simply say miembro del jurado. That's all there is to it. The um, localization principle allows us to eliminate sometimes a word because it really doesn't sound right in the opposite language. Uh, specific intent is intención específica. I just want to point out that intent is intención. No es intento, eh? Intento is attempt. So if I say, for example, attempted murder, intento de asesinato. So let me just write it here just in case. Attempt, intento. Okay. And inference by itself, you can, if you want, use the cognate. Inferencia is perfectly correct. You could also use deducción. It's up to you. Deducción or inferencia. But when you put to draw an inference, es sacar una conclusión. Now it's an idiomatic expression. To draw an inference. Sacar. Sacar una conclusión. Sacar una conclusión. And allegations son presunciones. I know you know this one, but just in case. Presunciones, no alegaciones. Presunciones, please. And the last one that I have for you is when she said, or when he said, rather, under oath or affirmation. Uh, 
Uh, quiere decir bajo juramento o bajo protesta. Affirmation, you know, like sometimes say, do you swear and affirm, jura o protesta. Now, when we use this protesta, we are really localizing more into Mexico, okay? But we have the option of localizing. Because the, the federal exam uses documents from Mexico, Central America, and Spain, it's always a good idea to localize in class from English into Spanish into those three, con three areas. So that way, you know, you become familiar with, in case you get a document from those areas. Any questions on this? Okay, so this ends lecture one after the break. Thank you. <laughs>